Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Um, this is uh, one of the AIN big topics. I'm Paul Z. Jackson, and it's my pleasure to be introducing Jeannie Lambin, who will take us through this afternoon or evening or morning. I know that there are people for each of those being an accurate description of their time of day to all of you. So uh, Jeannie, let me hand over to you to introduce yourself and introduce the session. Wonderful. Welcome, everybody. Uh, I would like to, uh, I'm just so glad that you can be here for the uh, celebration of the 2070 anniversary of the um, International Museum of Applied Improvisation. And so as part of the celebration, we thought it would be a really interesting thing to do to recreate the experience of a Zoom chat. Um, many of you, uh, because um, our lives have been extended, remember the early days of the AIN where we spent a lot of time first in an actual room together and then in virtual rooms. And so for those of you that haven't had that experience, we thought it would be just uh, a good thing to recreate. So I'm so glad that you're all here. Hopefully our technology is working for everybody. And we're just going to spend some time together today talking about time. Because it's something that we all have and that we all share. And it's the basis of so much of what we do. So welcome everyone. And with that, I'd love to start with an introduction of yourself. Um, I know for some of you, you might not have checked in in a while, but 2070, um, just tell us your name and where you're calling from. Well, I'm delighted to have survived till 2070. I didn't think I'd get as far as half past eight. My name is Paul Z. Jackson, and I'm calling from a satellite of London floating just a, a mile or two above the city. Just to unmute yourself when it's, when you feel it's your turn and jump in. Hello, I'm Kay. I'm calling to you from the um, uh, uh, international uh, settlement on Mars. AI and Mars. I am David. I'm 95 years old. And I just returned to where I lived back, uh, what year was that, 2020, uh, a city called Bellingham, Washington, that's north of Seattle. And we might be at, at like 2 million people now. Wow. Mm. Uh, hi, I'm Erica. <coughs> you can see. Oh, <laughs> I can barely talk. But it's been a really fun 50 years. And uh, <laughs> there are many of me. There are many, many of me. And uh, I'm enjoying being with all of you all at once. My name is Ed Greenberg. I um, used to live on the coast of California, in Southern California. I'm now in a uh, underwater domed city in Southern California. Wonderful. Hey, I'm Hello. Lisa. Oh, oh, go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. No, you go, no, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Hey, uh, so I am on the hyper bubble. It's, I'm so excited, man. Finally, after all these years, we did a hyper bubble like on the rings of Saturn and it's going amazingly and it's so smooth and so awesome and sparkly. Can't believe we're actually doing this. Hi, I'm Barbara and I am, I'm calling from uh, Baja, Mexico. And it's this amazing ecosystem where we've finally managed to find the balance between, you know, the, the needs of the, the people and the creatures on the planet and the, and the environment. And, you know, it's amazing. All is well. Um, I, hello everyone. I am Christiana Frank. I feel like I'm about the age of 12 today. And I am calling from a very serious headspace. Hi everyone. I'm, I'm 
Chen Zhen from Beijing. Uh, so it's so interesting that uh, we are at the time that everyone could stay at home and then doing the meditation <laughs> or stay with closer with families together and cook together and have a very wonderful time together. So, yeah. Anyone else? Hey, everyone. Yeah, I'm Hazel. I don't know if I, everyone's already been up. I'm, yes, I, hi, everyone. I'm calling from the Polar Circle. And in addition to the lovely Museum of Applied Improv, um, I'm also um, an avid fan of really old Macintosh computers. So right now I'm calling from a 2009 MacBook Pro. Um, having a little <laughs> trouble because Zoom, of course, is a little bit younger, even though that also is um, 50 years old by now. But it's really lovely to see you all. And um, yeah, I, I have a good collection. If someone visits the Polar Circle at some point, you can look at my, my really, really old antique Macintoshes. Wonderful. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Toby, and um, my camera is working. I'm just not uh, visible anymore. Um, <laughs> So um, yeah, that happened to some of us. Um, you know, it's been it's been quite the few decades. Um, it was really sad when um, many people didn't make it and it wasn't there. You know, there were there were people that were really advanced in applied improvisation, but um, you know, they just didn't have an eye and they lived in urban areas. And well, we know what happened to them. Um, I'm I'm very lucky. I live um, I live on a, a platform in the Atlantic Ocean, um, and um, in our biosphere here, we've been growing our own food and um, using applied improvisation to make uh, decisions and to run our community. And um, it's it's pretty awesome. There. Oh, there's a dolphin right there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Great to be here. Hi everyone, this is Yvette. Um, I'm really excited that you're all here with us. Uh, I've been in the future for quite some time as a futurist, so I'm super excited that y'all have joined me here as well. Uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to the session today, thanks. Wonderful. I believe that's everybody. Great. Thank you, everybody. And uh, I am calling from the uh, Musea Toot, which is a museum and an institute and inspired by kind of the Silicon Valley model, which we can you know, have more conversations about whether or not that was a good one to follow. But it's an idea of putting people with like interest together in kind of a museum institute landscape type of environment. So I'm thrilled that you're all here. And I'm just going to pause a moment and uh, take off the future hat and come to the present and just ask how was that experience of introducing yourself at a future point in time? And just jump in with whoever wants to begin. It was fun. It was fun. And what was fun about it? Just uh, the unexpectedness of it and then suddenly jumping in with, oh, okay say something and mm -hmm. uh yeah and just said the first thing that came into my head yeah. wonderful so saying the first thing that kind of came to mind yeah great other experiences i enjoyed doing it and hearing it i was go ahead Paul. particularly impressed that sorry i was particularly impressed that erica has actually gone to another planet as we can see with her background there Yeah, and Erica, you wrote that um, it was a little intimidating uh, to come up with something that made sense. And yeah, yeah, yeah. And other experiences. I was Hi. Go ahead. I was going to say, I was noticing that um, as it went along, the inventiveness went up. Like we were giving mm -hmm. each other permission to be creative and silly. Yeah. 
So permission to well, be creative and silly and learning from one another's inventiveness. Yeah, I would maybe add also that, yes, a little bit intimidating, maybe because there was, a, I had issues with the technology and then I realized I ran out of tea and then I'm trying to listen to everyone <laughs> and I'm like, shit, I'm up. Uh, what, uh, where do I press? I have to say something interesting. <laughs> So it was a little bit of, uh, also I have a deadline today, so this is probably not what I should be doing, but I really wanted to bring in. <laughs> so I have that, you should be, you know, whatever. So I was trying to focus and be interesting also. That's always a, a winner. <laughs> it was and fun. It's, 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 a very, it. it's a very interesting experience for me that uh, I listen to everyone say our timing. They're uh, talking about, uh, like the hazard talk about a Macintosh or someone else talk about something. So I didn't realize these rules because I'm late uh, to come. But my, my brain started working like, uh, okay, is everyone telling the truth or not? Um. <laughs> Which is very fascinating me. <laughs> now, now I know the answer. Yeah. So wondering <laughs> if everyone is telling the truth and kind of what are the rules of the game? Yeah. Mm. I liked um, it that it propelled me into hopes that I had for the future. So yes. I imagined what I would like to see at that time, other than maybe being alive with, you know, new, new techniques to, you know, <laughs> make that functional. But uh, yes, I, I appreciated imagining what was important to me about thinking forward. So, yeah, so getting access to a more hopeful mindset and then also thinking about kind of what it is in that future that you would like to see. Yes. Right. Other experiences. Uh, even, even I just didn't do this, but uh, I, my brain start imagine what would happen like uh, several months later when we are come, uh, my life come back to normal. That's very yeah. wonderful imagination for me. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Especially with everything going on right now. Yeah. yeah. So this point, so maybe your, you know, hopeful future could be just a few months um, from now. Yeah. 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 Any other thoughts or experiences? Um, hey, yeah, I love the dolphin. That was unexpected. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. A lot of what everyone's saying, like it was fun, but I felt pressure, which is interesting. Yes. Um, you know, I was like, oh, well, you know, I don't have to be that present. You know, this is just, you know, this is just an AIN call, right? Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm not really ready for anything. <laughs> you know, it was like, oh, wait, I have to. And then, you know, I, there was a, a moment where I was like, I love, of course, this is an AIN call. Like, we can just do this, right? Um, yeah, I love this group that we could just do this and try it out and just not explain a lot and just do it. Um, I, I also, you know, I would love to go on and on and on thinking about um, that future world. But for me, it, it I couldn't um, I guess I think about it. You know, a week doesn't go by when I don't think about it. So I, yeah, I had a real mixture. Um, you know, I think that human technologies, human abilities, and um, like we get to develop with applied information um, will be what, what, what provides any kind of happiness for future humans. Mm -hmm. um, but I also know that, you know, disparities and unfairness will, um, will get even more unfair. So I just it was like a real mixture of emotion. Yeah, and, and talking about, thank you, Toby, and I think that's a, a, a nice transition to the, uh, a couple things, and one is kind of the, um, with the intentionality of the brief, you know, sometimes I think that there can be like, okay, you need to do this and you do this, but also leaving a more open prompt, you know, what are the things that people self-organize then according to that prompt? And I think it's a really interesting metaphor for how we might imagine the future. So, you know, some of us want what we think about it to make sense. Um, some of us want to show up um, intelligently or in a certain way, 
or um, some of us really want to connect to hope and to something that's different um, than what is going on. And there were ideas of representations of self, of representations of the world, of very specific things related to the objects that currently populate our lives to you know these ideas of things that we might want or hope or fear that might come to pass and so interestingly in improv all those things are constantly happening all the time you know we're constantly invited to respond even though we don't know necessarily where it will go or what will happen we make rules for ourselves about that um, and we still show up and come up with something and that's ultimately what's going to happen with the future is that we will have to show up for it if we're lucky um, because we'll be in it. And you know, we can be then more intentional about the thoughts, imaginings and things like that we have. And that's an amazing ac ability that our brain has. So any other thoughts on the future before we transition to kind of the overview and next parts? I just wanted to add that when you arrived uh, with your future hat and said the words uh, like welcome to the museum of um, like we're in the year 2017 the museum of applied improv for me I was uh, a little how should I say I went off in a different direction uh, maybe because uh, for quite a few years I've actually tried to combine those things because I work in future studies yes. and I'm doing improv um, more and more applied but more also um, like performance improv. And I've been trying to find people who are sort of nerdy enough about the future to actually want to take uh, like real scenarios into improv work. So just the fact that you said that one sentence, I'm like, oh yeah, ah. So yeah, <laughs> I, I, I sort of was a little, <laughs> my focus uh, for, for coming up with something interesting next was, was a little off, but I'm really happy, yeah. yeah. Interestingly, there's a, apparently a, a, a many people who are either fortunate or not fortunate in not having a lot of uh, internal monologuing. And uh, one thing I love about these exercises is when people report out kind of their thought bubble, you know, and what's happening. And that's, um, that's always a delight to uh, be a part of that. Uh, wonderful. Um, any other thoughts? Uh, there's some chat things. Uh, yes. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, so Paul is uh, uh, kind of capturing some of the lovely points that people have made, and I'm just going to scroll and thank you for that, Hazel, and see if there's um, any. And Yvette, uh, yes, there is definitely a lot of trust in this group, and I'm so glad that you're here. Um, Yvette and I just started working together uh, as of, uh, well, officially on Monday, and so I'm thrilled that uh, she was able to join us. And um, if you have any questions about the future, um, Yvette is the person to ask, and it sounds like Hazel as well. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, so um, the future is... Me, may, may, yeah. may I interrupt for just a moment, please? Please do. The person, the person who is a um, future studies person, yeah. uh, what is her name? I'm, very curious to know a little more about that at some point. Great. Yeah, well, there's two. There's Hazel and Yvette. So um, did either of you just want to give a, a, sh a little introduction um, since uh, you're newer to this? And also, Marius, if you um, uh, want to pop into the chat or uh, come on voice, that's, um, that's great as well. Mm, yeah, hi, it's Hazel. I, I'm wondering what to say. So I've been working <laughs> in and around uh, the field of future studies for 10 years and oh, you know, technology is everywhere. Um, uh, I, I have done very little um, individual research, but I'm working with researchers and I run the Finnish Society for Future, future Studies. So I'm aware of all the stuff that's happening and and um, I see, especially for um, 
for workshops, for having people think about the future improv and any kind of creative processes, but specifically applied improv and, and drama techniques are really, really valuable. Yes. Because like, I, I love that you mentioned already like this safe uh, thing of like being a safe space and trust. Um, I think, especially in countries like I, I'm in Finland and here people find it really Mm, difficult to jump in and start pretending there's someone else and yeah. and visioning the future because we usually think like well this is how it's been and then it's gonna just go on um, in the same way but with more gadgets um, so the fact that improv can can first create that space where you can say silly things and it's okay to mm, yeah. sort of make um, mistakes in that sense um, and then only after that can you start working with people to yes. talk about what's possible outside of the realm of our everyday lives. And um, yeah, so I, I've really been wanting to start some sort of project to combine them both with performances, but also with really applied stuff. And so, yeah, I, I guess we can share, or you have also information, um, our contacts after the, this session if people want to email or something like that. Yeah, if you want your contact info shared, uh, just um, put it in the, your, in the chat and then I'll be sending out a follow-up um, email and just like a housekeeping thing, um, I'll be sending in the follow-up some useful resources and links related to kind of time perception and, um, and some of the background research that's been informing this work recently um, at some point, might not be immediately. <laughs> Great, thank you. In and some time, yes. In some time, yes, exactly. Um, I, I thought that was a great um, perspective, Hazel, and um, I, I, I would say yes and, as my experience in, um, in this arena has just begun in terms of improvisation. So I've been in the foresight field for about 10 years. I started off uh, as Disney's futurist and um, started a, a group there focused on the focus of uh, the future of work. Um, and that's where I met my now business partner, Frank Spencer. And together we own a firm named Kedge and we started um, an offering called the Futures School, which um, really um, drives our mission of democratizing the future and democratizing the field of foresight. We really believe if everybody thought like a futurist, the world would be a better place. So um, as Jean said, we have the privilege of having her join our team this week. And uh, so we're really excited about the intersection of these fields and just see so much potential. Uh, and really, like you said, opening people's vistas uh, for the future and letting them let down their guard about what's possible. Um, both, you know, the, the maybe the, the stopic uh, view, but hopefully also the uh, more optimistic and transformative view, which is how our firm leads. Um, so, um, so yeah, so that's a little bit about uh, my um, sort of experience in foresight. My business partner, Frank Spencer, has a master's degree in strategic foresight. So, um, so we lean on his um, academic expertise heavily. Um, and we've had the privilege to work with a lot of organizations and individuals across the globe for the last 10 years. So we love it. It's exciting. It's fun. Um, and, you know, we're always trying to invent new things. So um, thanks for, uh, for asking. Great. Thank you for, for, those, so for those introductions. And Ed, also thank you for that prompt of um, um, inquiry um, and wanting to know a bit more. And um, great. And I see the contacts popping up. And we've had a couple more uh, people that have joined. Uh, we have Julian. I believe he is calling in from Paris. And... Uh, we have uh, Marius um, from Norway, and then um, um, uh, I think those are the new people that uh, have popped into the call. And so one of the reasons, um, and this is a, this builds on what was said. So one of the reasons why I personally became interested in kind of time and experience was my background is in archeology span and anthropology and historic preservation. And when I was working as an archeologist, I did a lot of surveys for kind of like highway development and things like that. So it wasn't, you know, the very exciting, you know, finding all sorts of valuable artifacts kind of mode, but I was at one point um, on, on a survey project and I was in the middle of this field and there was a known site there and I was looking for it. And um, 
I, I, you know, we weren't finding it. And all of a sudden I kind of looked down and there right at my feet was this amazing archaic projectile point. You might know it as an arrowhead, but it was probably about 5,000 years old. And I reached down and picked it up and it was just this, like, I felt like it was like the handshake of the infinite. Like at some point, at some time, this person had dropped this artifact and then I was the first person possibly to pick it up um, and hold it. And you know, what had happened in that space and all of a sudden the, like the loops intertwined and there was that, you know, infinity connection. And, and then, um, you know, I worked in historic preservation and one thing that I found interesting was that people seemed incapable of seeing a historic building or property in anything other than its um, current state. Not some people, but not all people, but there were some people that no matter how much you talked about what was possible, um, that they couldn't imagine that. And so I became really curious about the imagination for the future and why some people were much better at that. And then what were the building blocks and then I came across an idea that we use the same part of our brain to remember the past as we do to imagine the future. And so since I was in the business of memory, um, I thought, holy crap, I can help people find a lot of good stuff to use. And that's kind of how the process started. And so I wanna share a quote related to that. And this also builds on um, what some others have said about kind of memory and the role of that. And this is from a great book, um, Mapping the Mind, um, and it's on memorizing the future. And um, I'll just share this one component. At first sight, memory and imagination seem quite distinct. The first is concerned, after all, with what has happened already, whereas the second is all about what has not. But recent studies show that imagination is wholly dependent on memory because memories are its building blocks. When we imagine something happening, we root around in our memory and come up with experiences which seem likely to occur. Then combine them, chop them, shake them, and blend them until they come out as something apparently entirely different. Even the most phantasmagoric scenes derive from things, they have already, from things that have already occurred. We simply can't invent something for which we do not already have the ingredients any more than we can rustle up a dish made of things that we do not have in the larder. Which is in, in, in essence, in many ways, that is also improv, where um, we call upon our past, our present, and our imagination to create something in that. So any thoughts on that uh, before we move into another exercise? I was actually typing, but I realized I can't type and listen to your <laughs> great <laughs> quotes at the same time. When you mentioned that thing that people can't imagine um, things or, or places in uh, any other state than the current, I just had a very vivid memory of, of two places where I've been, where it's sort of been a historic place. And one was a very pleasant um, experience, one was very unpleasant, but somehow those had enough of I don't know what it is, memory or energy conserved in them. They actually, I could hear the past. I could hear people's yeah. sounds. Um, one was a terrible place where there was a mass, had been a massacre and one was just um, like a marketplace and both were, uh, one was uh, from the Harappan age, like 9,000 years ago. And um, yeah, it doesn't always happen, but sometimes it does. And I, mm -hmm. it would be great for me, at least we've, we've tried to do these, Mm, exercises where we get a map and we actually go out into the actual city uh, or whatever it is the space and there we imagine because there you don't just sit in at a table and and draw papers about the future you actually go out and you're like okay what could be here right. um, which I think is sort of the other way of of doing it than uh, archaeology I suppose you actually yeah. have to be at the site yeah yeah wonderful yeah. Um, thanks for all this. Um, just I'm walking in the woods, so I'm sharing beauty with you as we speak. Um, you know, Jean, I've known you for so long, and I I've known your work, but I've never actually 
made this connection between <laughs> our work. So when I did my doctoral research, my research was on collective memory and how it impacted conflict and people's wow. perceptions of conflict. And the first line of my dissertation was a quote from George Santayana, who said, those who do not know their history are doomed to repeat it. And I kind of turned it and I said, well, sometimes when we do know our history, we're doomed to repeat it. So I just want to kind of honor this connection between past and future. And uh, amazing that we've never kind of found that mm -hmm. point before. Yeah. And, and it's, and, and there's, I mean, what I love about these calls is that there's so many connections. And then to add the time layer to it too, is that there's this really interesting thing that we're all here at the same time, but it's all a different time for us, literally and emotionally and um, cognitively and kind of, you know, where we are in the season of our life. So there's this, you know, this beautiful multiplicity that often exists in these experiences. Um, Oh, this, it's so hard to just not let my, you know, idea monkey um, just <laughs> go nuts um, and just be like, okay, we're going to, but anyway, I'm going to keep on track. Um, if uh, So any other thoughts on kind of the connections between time and story and place, um, people, um, and, uh, and Julian had um, uh, uh, talked about the, um, the links to storytelling in that um, the retelling of the past um, stories will help listeners shape their future. Absolutely. And a fascinating thing about memory, as some of you may know, is that our memory uh, of an experience doesn't exist in just like one solid, beautiful little chunk in our brain, like a shelf full of books in a, in a library, that um, our memories are dispersed. And so when we remember, we're actually calling upon um, that memory to be gathered and collected. And so that's why when once you start remembering, oftentimes you bump into all these other memories that are kind of in that place because they're, they're kind of all meshed together. So this is an exercise to kind of get at that. So does everyone kind of have a pen and paper handy? Okay, and if not, I will give you a moment to um, uh, gather one. Okay, and then let's see. Um, oh, great. And yes, Hazel let us know that uh, World Future Day is March 1st, um, which is fantastic. Uh, 24 hours of talking about the future in all time zones all over the world. Um, what day of the week is that? That is, that would be a great day to have a, a quest, um, an asynchronous quest of um, hmm, ideas. Okay. Um, and then, uh, Paul, that remembering, uh, just doing a great job of, uh, transcribing relevant and, or maybe, uh, points from the conversation. Great. Okay. So if everyone has their, um, writing implements, um, this is an exercise that was inspired by Linda Berry. For those of you that don't know Linda Berry's work, she's, uh, does graphic novels and then she also has a writing and creativity class which is absolutely amazing and her work is absolutely compelling thoughtful delves a lot into the intersection uh, intersection of memory place and time and it's just um, it's incredible stuff and I will provide a link to that in the in the webinar notes but so this exercise is based on that so what we're going to do is in the first part we're going to kind of do a little memory gathering. So we're just going to uh, start with some objects, then kind of build the room around that. And then the exercise will build um, from there. So I'll give the kind of prompts to kind of build and scaffold that as we go. Does that sound okay to everybody? Great, wonderful. Okay, and, um, and then uh, Cheng said that maybe the innovation from the past uh, as the new thoughts all connect with things which already exist. Yes, beautiful. Um, yeah, there are these, um, and that connects to what Hazel said about the sounds of the past that I think, um, um, I think that material life has a lot of life and connection. So wonderful. Okay, so if everyone would just take a moment um, and we're going to uh, choose a table 
And so if you would just make a list um, and there's no, you know, optimal number, but just take a uh, about 30 seconds and just make a list of all the tables that you've known in your life. So, you know, the table in, you know, your apartment now, uh, the table in your office, uh, the table that was in the kitchen of your aunt um, that you loved visiting when you were growing up, um, a table in a, um, you know, a classroom, wherever, whatever table, there's no, um, any table is fair game. Okay, in about 15 more seconds. Okay, and then wrap up with whatever tables appeared. Great. And did everybody find some tables in their memory? Okay, excellent. And um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to spend a little time with one of those tables and we'll be kind of building the memory out around that table. So if you have a particular table that you would like to spend more time with, um, you can select one. If you would like to kind of just approach it with a little more um, curiosity and just randomly close your eyes and put your hand on the page to pick a table, um, that's fine too. And then also just if there's a table that has appeared from your memory archive that um, might be a bit more emotionally uh, laden or charged, um, we will be spending a little bit more time. So just as long as you're, um, you know, comfortable with spending time with that table and perhaps even telling us a little bit about it, um, that's okay. But just, you know, we will be talking about the tables. So one manage one's own comfort with uh, disclosure um, in that. Okay, so um, so everybody just uh, does everybody have a table? Great, wonderful. Okay, now just um, I'm going to invite everybody to close their eyes, and if you are more comfortable turning off your screen uh, so that <laughs> um, people aren't peering at you with your eyes closed, that's great too. And I'm going to invite you to a series of prompts uh, to spend, um, to build out that memory of the place a bit. And just take a couple deep breaths. And now that you're with your table, just take a moment to look around and picture that in your mind's eye. Imagining where you are. And are you doing anything? Maybe you're sitting or standing or just present in the room. And looking at the table, what is its shape, its texture, is it bigger? or smaller than you remembered it. If it's in a room, where is it in the room? What is above you? What is behind you? Is there anyone else in the room with you? Can you tell from the light 
what time of day it is. How old are you? Do you know what time of year it is? Why are you there? What is there in the room or on the table that you are curious about or interested in? And now take a moment to look around the space once more, to look at the table. You can even imagine putting your hand on it. Thank your memories for appearing. And whenever you're ready, open your eyes and turn back on your video if you're so inclined. Welcome back to the present. And how is that experience? Um, <clears throat> let's see if I can talk. Uh, it was like a combination of you know, it definitely brought me to a specific memory. Mm -hmm. And then I really felt this back and forth between sometimes feeling like information was surprising me, like, oh, I mm -hmm. didn't remember. And like, it was, oh, like a real discovery, like you said, of things bumping around. Mm -hmm. I was like sometimes doing that, but then other times I could, watching my brain, like going and running around and trying to figure things out and be like, mm, well, mm -hmm. there would have been a bunk bed. Yeah, I think I remember the bunk bed. And just totally fabricating, you know, I could totally see that process of fabrication also like attempting to happen. So they're both, I felt like there were two different responses going on at the same time. Mm. And then there was a motion at the same time of just sort of what it felt, you know, what the memory was there. Yeah, and with that, Erica, there's, uh, I, I appreciate that. And there's something that's called kind of, that some people call a time signature, which is kind of how you experience time. So it's the experience of the time, the patterns you recognize with time, the larger world in which that time exists. And so it's interesting to hear that reflection of kind of, in some ways, that experience of kind of the, the kind of visceral, emotional, embodied experience of time, and then the kind of more... Um, uh, observational and perhaps even kind of analytical. Yeah, and then a third one of where I really would just have these pop-ups of memories, like yeah. what the underside of that table looked like. And I, yeah. I wasn't hunting for that. It was, it it was like that felt authentic, like a little like you described, like something that was sort of stored in there somewhere that I wouldn't have found otherwise. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we have, there's an amazing storage bin like right here. So um, great. Other, other thoughts or experiences? I'd have to say that um, I thought it was lovely, first of all. Thank you very much. And I'd have to say for me, um, I was very aware that in this exercise that it's a lot easier for me to listen to someone else than to take myself through that guided imagery. Mm -hmm. and, you know, that's a skill set I would like to be able to turn and mirror on myself. Um, so it's kind of like a personal statement. Um, 
because as you walked me through that, I could smell things, I could feel textures, but it's almost as if I have to hear it from another voice. Mm -hmm. And for me, that can be um, a little confusing is because I would like to be able to initiate that on my own. Um, and I have tried in the past, but it's not such, it's not so impactful as when I listen to someone else speaking. Thank you, Christiana. And yes, I think that sometimes um, that, that guided process of having the prompts um, provided, um, and I'm happy to kind of provide the basic script or um, in, in time, I can also, um, one of the things that I wanna do is make a, um, a voice recording so that this can just be accessible and also for doing it with my own work of doing that. So I will put that on the list if that would be helpful. Great, thank you. Wonderful. Yes, and having that guide is a, a very apt metaphor as well of someone to kind of help us walk through our experience sometimes. Other thoughts or experiences? I've done this uh, many times, not this exactly, but um, an exercise where in pairs you describe like a childhood room or like a bedroom or yeah. a room that you know very well. And then because you're actually moving your body and you're showing like, okay, here's the bed and he, you know, here are the curtains. And then when the other person is actually prompted uh, by the teacher before to ask more questions, there's usually a lot of details that come out. And some sort of bonding is like, oh, I had that same thing. Or, um, and um, so this was a little similar, but it was interesting because I haven't really been to this room. It was a room I, uh, or a table that I, I stayed when I was um, 14, just for one year. And it was interesting because I, even before you asked about the time of day or the season, I saw them through the window. So then when you ah. asked them, it was like, of course, I don't even have to imagine because I already, because it was the light that came to the table and I knew that it was like late afternoon in November or something like that. So yeah, it was a really nice exercise. And I, some, some things I, I felt bad for not being able to see. I was like, okay, there's the whole blurry area. I don't know what's there in the room. But then I saw a very specific, like a pen that I was a little surprised that I remembered. So yeah, very nice exercise. Yeah, and in the blurry area of information that's not there, there's a, a writer, Jasper Forty, who does uh, speculative fiction, and uh, he um, talks, there's an ability of people to go back in time and look at their memories, but if you go back in the space, you actually have the ability to really look at it, and parts of it are missing, because the way our brain works, we automatically kind of knit things together, even if we don't have the information. So part of the intentionality of working this muscle is, you know, looking back to the past where we can really kind of dig in and see and then forward casting that to, you know, the present, like how can we be more attuned to what's now? And then also imagining, um, you know, what we can do with that information. Other experiences. Julian. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So I was, um, it's funny how when you said table, I saw the, the material, the wood, and uh, it's like a zoomed in vision of the, the actual table. Was very close to it and then when I zoomed out um, and he said oh if it's a very emotional you know just feel comfortable uh, but it was a very happy memory that I stole away right. and I couldn't I hadn't accessed it in in years actually so I was felt very emotional just thinking about that um, it's just a very simple childhood memory with my dad uh, I was just sitting at the table um, uh, lunching with him when I was very small every day I would go home for lunch I was very uh, lucky in that respect and it's funny how I was trying to rebuild all the little details because I, I know it was lunch but I can't remember the exact shapes and colors and things on the table but I know about one or two things because it's part of the memory and how much we laughed that day uh, for a very stupid stupid reason <laughs> and uh, so it's funny how it's linked for me it's very strongly attached to emotions you know, when I was, uh, whether, when we were selecting the tables, it always linked to a very strong emotional episode, happy or, or sad, but um, yeah, so for me, it's definitely linked to that, so. Wonderful. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so recalling and then also re-experiencing that kind of happy emotion and something definitely. small that hadn't been remembered um, yeah. for a yeah. long time. Yeah, yeah. 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 wonderful. 
any other um, thoughts before we go on to the next uh, quick exercise and then we have to sadly wrap up? Yeah. So, yeah, Papa, you go ahead. No, you go ahead. Okay. Um, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Um, when you were talk, uh, talking about uh, uh, the table, uh, uh, I, I immediately uh, thought about the, 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 my, my, my school time. So we have lots of tables over there and it's really strong emotion attached to that table. And uh, uh, there is a thing about uh, if you hate or you dislike or if you love and that memory just uh, remain your, your hyper uh, campus, like the core of the brain. So it's like two side of brain, so you can hate or either like it. So you really, really clearly to, to it's like a hot uh, Photoshop. It's like a Photoshop, it's just stay over there. Yeah. Right? So yeah, it's, 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 it's something you can dig out because it's not, uh, it's not a short-term memory, it's long-term memory. You can never forget in your lifetime. Yeah. 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 And, and yes, that we have a lifetime of memories that um, accompany us. And sometimes that can be a good thing. And sometimes it can be challenging. And usually it's a blend of the two. Yeah. Wonderful. I, I just wanted to thank you for helping me uncover the source of my rebelliousness. Um, <laughs> so the, the table that I imagined was the table that I grew up with in my family home. And I used to spend a lot of time under the table, like making forts and just whatever, you know, as a kid. And I will never forget the first time I saw that tag that says, you know, do not remove under penalty of law that is attached to so many pieces of furniture or whatever, at least here in the US. And I remember thinking, well, why? Like who will find out? Like, is there a camera? How will they know if I, <laughs> if I tear it off? And I was, I remember so many times being under there, like tempted to tear it off to see what would happen. And so that's the memory that came as like this sort of provocation <laughs> to rebel. Um, so thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Wonderful. Um, this is, this is, um, so any other thoughts or um, reflections? And I want, did want to share what Lori said that um, the, her experience was mixed and kind of bittersweet. I loved having the table show up in the first place. I've had two to three traumatic brain injuries, so I have trouble with my memory. I loved the prompts and appreciated the information that did come up makes me want to wander those halls more. And yes, and so this is, and that's, thank you, Lori, that's, um, those halls are always there. And that setting aside the time to kind of spend time with memories. I think sometimes it's easy to take that um, process A for granted um, because it's accessible. And then also for those of us that have had difficult or traumatic experiences or memories that then sometimes that process can be somewhat fearful or challenging. So figuring out what that balance is of comfort with um, spending time with memories in kind of a way of not with judgment or attachment, but just that noticing of what appears um, with that. Um, great. Um, uh, yes, and uh, Christiana notes that our mood while trying uh, to recall events at a later date can affect our ability to gather those memories back. Correct, yes, absolutely. Yes, our current self um, can influence how um, we call upon our past self. And um, sadly, we are running um, out of time because there's, there's two other exercises that I will tell you that we're building on this and we won't have time to play because we're at the close to the close and there's just a closing part for you. But um, one is that um, to build on uh, that, that Christiana said is that one of the reasons why I think that um, the accessing of memory is so important that we've all played word association. And if you haven't, it's where, you know, one person says a word, the next person says whatever word comes to mind and you keep going. And what I really noticed with that is if I was the one to start, the word that I started with and the tone that I used profoundly impacted the words that followed. So if I started with a dark or angry or negative word, 
then what flowed from that was often dark and angry and negative. And so in thinking about this in terms of then, you know, the scenes that would grow and build from that, um, oftentimes it had that cast. So in calling these things into being, you know, what is the emotional attachment and core that we're putting on that? And then how might that play out into the future? So, so the next, um, so a step, so that's related to word association. Then the next step with this game would be that then we would build out the room of memory together. Um, and uh, I will ask our um, grandmaster, uh, Paul, is it okay if we, um, if we go over about five and a half minutes and it, with everyone on the call, is it okay if we go? Um, about five and a half minutes over. It is. The, these calls are scheduled for ninety minutes, so you can. Oh go my God! It's like Christmas. <laughs> Thirty minutes over if anyone stays with you, and I will. Wonderful! Oh, this is so exciting! Oh my gosh! Okay, all right. I got to calm down. Excellent. Okay, but inside, this is still happening in my brain. Okay, so then we can go to the next step. All right, so um, so the next step in this would be to build out the the memory palace, so to speak. And so with this, um, is um, is it okay with everyone if we collectively build on one another's memory to create one shared room that we can all kind of walk around in together? Is that okay? Great. Okay, so, so the way it works, it's a very simple extension of the yes and. So someone will say, you know, there is a table. Um, yes, and, um, and then you, you know, recall something from your own experience. And so um, the idea is that we just populate the space in the way that it emerges. So um, that's basically the very loose prompt. Does that make sense to everybody? And so you just name whatever it is that you saw in your room. So it can be um, people, it can be the minutia of, you know, like a door handle or um, the time of year. So we just yes and and go around and build out the room. So um, we'll start with it. We'll just uh, close our eyes for a moment and take a breath and remember our room and our table, or if you're outside. And then come back and I would like to welcome you all to the space that we're going to create and if there's someone that would like to start please go ahead and you can just start with there is a table there is a table It's in a classroom at school. Yes, and it's made out of cardboard. On the table, there is a very colorful ink uh, pen that you can fill little cartridges in, in and um, it's a body shop pen of plastic. Yes, and there's a deck of cards on the table that are halfway out of the box. Yes, and the room smells like it hasn't been used since yesterday. Yes, and the floor is brown and tan square tiles. Yes, and through the windows on the left-hand side of the room, I can see the trees outside. Uh, yes, and if you look far, there's, uh, uh, there are big mountains. Yes, and the door to the room is open and it's a little warm outside. 
Yes. We ask the, and the floor is cold. Yes, and there is a light, a spring light coming in through the window. Yes, and the ceiling is very high. Yes, and there's a slight noise of a light bulb that's buzzing just by being on. Hmm. Yes, and you can hear the birds, the voices come from the outside of the house, the room. Yes, and there's wallpaper on the walls, which is sort of a bluish color and big, big flowers. Hmm. Yes, and there is a map uh, hand on the wall as well. Yes, and there's a TV with tin foil for the antenna. <laughs> yes, and there are two dozen empty boxes of tin foil next to the TV. Yes, and there are termites in the wood in the floor. Yes, so the map shows a military campaign route. Lovely. Yes, and that is the room that we were all in. And if you want to take a moment and just reflect on all the things that we saw in the room. And then uh, reflect on how that experience was. To me, there's a, a quality to the silence mm. that we're sharing right now and that we were sharing during the exercise. Yes. And I'm not sure I have any more words in the spirit of short turn taking. I'll leave it at that. I love that silence followed the remark about silence. The word I was thinking of about the exercise and Toby's comment was sweet. Mm. I was just thinking that if we were each listing an object sort of as bullet points, it would mm. have been harder to remember, but because we had a room we were visualizing, I'm wondering if it was easier for me to remember because I was thinking of the relationship between things. So co contemplating if it was easier to remember be, because we were, we had this space that we were recalling um, and then the relationships were easier to kind of pull together. Yeah, maybe relationships and at least for me personally, visualizing it yeah. helps. Great. I was gonna, I feel like walking us through our own specific visualization first, you know, and really feeling it and sensing that made it a lot easier to yes and other, other ideas, um, mm. incorporate those on like a really thoughtful, as opposed to just other yes and games I've played where you're going back and forth and it's real easy. It's almost like that word association. This yeah. one's a lot more heartfelt. Mm. 
Um, I hate to do this. I have to go. Um, but thank you very much. Thank you for joining. It was so nice oh, to see God. you. Good. Yeah, and so, and this is, you know, now people are leaving our room and it's, it's sad, but um, um, other, uh, yes, uh, yeah, Julian, uh, reminding of Invocation, which is a very, um, uh, a great game on kind of calling to uh, be objects into, into life and spaces. Um, other thoughts or experiences on that? Uh, I got uh, like three things or three spaces uh, or time spaces in my head. One is my past memory, another mm. at the present uh, with everyone we connecting the, like uh, connecting with each other thoughts. Another something I really want to see. Sometimes I mix them together. Sometimes uh, I attend to forget the future. What I want to see, I forget. Uh, <laughs> the past so i have to stay with everyone just the present so it's something like a really interesting three things happening like that was beautifully put and um i think um the uh i have three time spaces in my heart um would be a great um t-shirt <laughs> yeah I'm, I'm putting that on my list other experiences <clears throat> For me, I had a moment sort of towards the end, maybe 80% of, after we did 80% of the, uh, of the descriptions, because I somehow understood that we were to add, of course, this is rule setting probably on my own part, but add things from our past, the, the previous rela uh, imagined room or remembered room. So I picked whatever I said actually had been in the room that I had just previously imagined. But then I was like, wait, these people are now playing another game and like, I'm pretty sure there wasn't tinfoil and the boxes. And so suddenly I'm like, oh, this is a new thing. And then we already ended. So I, I sort of, yeah, it was an interesting switch where I, I thought I knew what was happening and then people started playing and I got a little, a little later than <laughs> some people. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Yeah. And yeah, that thought that you knew what was happening and then something switched and it's like, is this still the same um, thing? Yeah. But it was a really yeah. nice sort of, I just noticed going like, ah, oh, this is what we're doing now. So when it went from adding to playing. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so what, and I want to, so I'll have a question related to that, but I want to hear um, other, uh, any other thoughts or reflections. I really liked my journey to, you know, that you led us on. And I like hearing other people's journeys. And I like like the first five offers of the shared one, or maybe 10. But then, and then I like lost my investment in it, you know, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. it was sort of cluttering up and it was like everything, they're going in different directions. And it just, it like, I, I lost, it felt like it lost it's poignancy, like I was willing to have poignancy in an imaginary room for a while, but not 30 different rooms all mashed together. Just, <laughs> I lost my um, investment in it. Yes, yeah, so the, um, the so, so building aligned in some ways with uh, Hazel's comment about kind of you know, the, the shift and then where does one kind of remain um, engaged um, in the world that's being built or where does one kind of uh, have a different experience of the world um, that's being built? Um, yeah. Yeah, maybe because I was primed for like the poignancy of the first activity. And that's yeah. sort of how I was, you know, hearing it through at first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, helpful note. Other other experiences? Yeah, one thing I noticed, something you said, Erica, <clears throat> made me think of this, that, that I didn't experience any blocking. There weren't any yeah. contradictory offers uh, negating someone else's offer. They all, in my mind at least, fit together. So it, yeah, so there, there wasn't negation or blocking and all the offers fit together, or yeah, fit together. Any it felt other? like it, it, oh, go ahead. it felt like dreamlike a little bit, definitely more than the memory, because there were these weird elements coming from different perspectives, and, and I was like, "Oh, uh, 
almost like a magical land where there was these objects together and slowly being revealed to everyone. And I, I like the feeling. It is definitely something that can't be created on on one's own. So it was a it's a really cool shared like any shared experience, you know, group shared experience. It's something very unique. Uh, in terms of what comes up in your imagination, how you picture things, because you know the pen that was there, I I see it in my mind, probably not the same as any you know other members uh, of this group. So it's kind of a, it's different for everyone, but it's also collective. So it's it's very interesting. Yeah, and in in storytelling, I kind of call that the specific universal or the universal specific. That we all have our experiences of pens and tables and love and loss and hope um but our uh you know we have a shared idea of what those might be um but then our each the specifics of our detail you know of that are all unique and so with this exercise how many of you had kind of stories emerge about the table um that presented itself oh definitely yeah and so with the stories that emerge with that were there times in the recreation of the room where there was a moment of like, that's not how the story went or that's not what happened. Or you thought, Oh, that makes me think of something else that I hadn't thought of. Yeah. Second thoughts. Yes. Yeah. Second thoughts. Yeah. Mm. So this is, um, so this game could be played either calling upon past memories dealing you know then or you could you know recreate a room in the present especially if you're in a virtual space you know by inviting everybody to describe something that's in their present environment um that um and so as a way to kind of build a shared community in a virtual space of you know how we're experiencing it and what we see out the window and oh i didn't know you know um there were mountains visible from the window and then you could also do this for the future. So what is a room that we would like to be in? So if we went back to that self that we introduced ourselves as at the beginning, um, what would it be like to run through that exercise and to visit that space and to kind of imagine those tangible aspects of it, of you know, what the room feels like, um, what's in the room, um, who might be in the room, um, what time of year it is, um, and all those things. So there's all sorts of different ways to kind of move the time lens with that exercise and kind of play with the intentionality of it. And, um, and then also with that, there's the, um, there's the stories that we all carry with us. And um, we didn't do a whole lot of storytelling um, today. Um, and I'm happy to talk more about that and do a future one. But one of the things with kind of bringing out stories related to memory is that you know sometimes those can be um emotional experiences or different things can appear which is all there's no um and i wanted to make sure that we had enough time to kind of do um to honor those stories that would appear in a careful and intentional way um, and so this was kind of part one of you know here's the thing and so I'll pause for a second with any thoughts or reflections and then launch into the final bracket of that. Hello, this is Ed Greenberg again. Can you hear me? Yeah, hi Ed. Hi, so I have to get off, unfortunately. I have to uh, leave for the day, uh, but I just wanna share with everyone Thank you so much for this. Last night, I was at an event in Los Angeles, which was the world premiere, not the world premiere, but the uh, premiere of a brand new movie about uh, the Rwandan genocide. And it was so powerful, and there were people there from the Shoah Foundation and genocide survivors. And the fact that that happened last night, and this was this morning, it was so um, much a part of my experience from last night. In, and I'll just say that the value of this work for resilience and healing and the need to remember is uh, this has been a very powerful morning after the uh, panel and film from last night. Thank you. Thank you, Ed.
yeah that's lovely um and and i and i um i think ed said it so beautifully and that our memories are so powerful and can be um generative and kind and um they can be bridges to help us be in the now and then also to imagine um, a future. And so being intentional with that amazing ability that we have to constantly move backward forward um, in, the, um, in the time kind of horizon is an amazing and powerful capacity that we have. Any other yeah. thoughts or reflections? Yes, I, towards the end of the, our story, I was noticing that there were no people. I don't think there were any people in the room. Ah, and just yeah. that, and the, just the, the texture of the space got me thinking, well, uh, where are the people? There used to be people in the room and they're gone. Yeah. Why, aren't, why are they gone? What happened to them? So I was thinking about that as well. Yeah, yeah, it's interesting that no one showed up in our room. Um, yeah, and in this, and this is the interesting thing where you can observe. I mean, it's it, it's this fascinating thing where you can be in and then observe and all of that. Yeah, any other thoughts or reflections? Well, to me, it did feel abandoned because no one mentioned the the people, and then there was, yeah. well, no one had been there for one day, and there was a map with some uh, some more things which is a little odd because it did feel like a classroom for some reason, but they had all left, they'd gone. It was a little, yeah. Do we want to invite our people into the room and so we can um, leave them there to, um, to hang out? Um, uh, should we just invite our person uh, by name that we would like to, uh, if they would like to be in the space? I imagined we were all in the room together. Ah, nice. So. It wasn't empty. We were all there. Uh, but yes, let's uh, add more people as we want. I, uh, I, defin yep, I, I definitely had the feeling it was so strong and it was, I realized that it, it, it could have just been me. But from early on, I had the feeling like all of us were one, like this was one brain seeing and we as one person, we're waiting for this awesome other person to arrive. Um, there was something about the, the playing card. Like I had this expectation like, oh goody, they're gonna get here and this like cool magical thing's gonna happen. Yeah, yeah, and, and so I think I love that, that this magical thing is going to happen. So with that, um, we were, were going to um, draw to a close. There's one final kind of meditation uh, that we have, and then I know Paul has some announcements. Um, and so before we launch into that, I, um, I would love to, um, well, I wouldn't love to, I will. I just I thank you everybody for taking the time to show up. And I really appreciate the uh, care and curiosity and generosity that uh, you all brought to this lovely virtual space. And I know this will be a recording that will be stored in the archives of the uh, International Museum of Applied Improvisation in this recreated Zoom space. So I will turn it over to Paul and then I'll, then after that, I'll do the closing um, meditation. Thanks, Jeannie. Uh, it will also be archived and available on the AIM YouTube channel more immediately um, in a few days, I imagine. And um, I will keep the chat because I'm not sure whether that appears or not in the archive but it may be useful to us on another occasion so that will be available in some form too. Um, um, the next events on AIN webinars are on Monday the 2nd of March which is a 60 minute social, no agenda, whatever emerges. That will be hosted by Suzanne Shinko Fishley. Then on the 19th of March, Thursday the 19th of March, Beth Boynton is going to do a big topic, 
medical improv, state of the art. And then there are two per month alternating 60 minute socials and big topics through the rest of the year. But if you have others that you would like to host, either a hosting people for a 60 minute chat or a specific topic that you'd like to present, then do please email me and make that proposal. The ones that I've mentioned are all at 4 p.m. UK time and all of the big topics are at that time as that gives us the maximum spread around the world. But the 60 minute socials are at the time proposed by the host of that social and they do range by at least 12 hours difference across different time zones through the year so that, um, that everyone has a chance to have something that's a more convenient time for their area. That will continue in the future as a policy of making them as available as possible along with the availability of the recordings. So with a few minutes left I'm going to hand that back to Jeannie and when she finishes her meditation um, we'll stay open for a couple more moments in case there are other comments or responses that people would like to make and then I'll stop the recording at that point. Jeannie back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Paul, and thank you for your always amazing uh, co-piloting. It's fantastic to have you as a wingman, um, and I always enjoy um, being with you in a virtual space, and I look forward to seeing you in an actual one next month. So exciting. Um, so thank you to Paul, and also just thank you for being the, the one who makes all these webinars happen. So with that, um, we're going to do one last closing meditation, and then Paul and I will hang out in case that are, are there are any questions. So. Um, you're welcome to close your eyes if that's comfortable uh, for you or turn off your video or do whatever it takes um, to get a little comfortable. I'll give a moment for that. Great. And so I'm just going to run you through a little guided uh, voice exercise um, to leave um, on. The universe might have been created billions of years ago. It might have been created five minutes ago. And all the notions of time and space were embedded in the cosmos at its moment of creation. Whether the Big Bang happened five minutes ago or five billion years ago, I know not. But here's an idea. What if all the stories and the memories in the universe were created at the same moment? Some are floating towards us and others hurtling away. And these moments, exquisite and infinite, finite and mundane, these memories, these stories, were all part of that moment. What if part of our purpose here is to capture those stories before they go hurtling off into space? Because embedded in those stories of love and loss, despair and hope, are secrets that will sustain us in a complex and sometimes chaotic world. Now, just remember, dwell in the floating world, inhabit the liminal spaces of time gone by. Now, remember a time where you felt great, giant, heart-swelling hope. Maybe you were five, maybe you were 50. Maybe it was so long ago you can't remember it. Maybe it is now, but remember, inhabit the moment, be in that space. What is above you? What is below you? In front of you? Behind? Who is with you? Reach out, grab that moment. Now fold it carefully. What is a word, a phrase, a key to remember? Write it down, carry it with you. When you need it, when you need hope, take it out, go to that space, unfold your corner of the cosmos, remember it, share it, and thank you. And whenever you're ready, you can come back to the room, stay or sign off, and I thank you. Thanks, Jeannie. I'm going to pause the recording.